Well, good morning again and welcome. Uh, we're so pleased to see uh, so many familiar faces, but also like the ones that are trying to learn more about this fascinated world of neuromuscular diseases, in particular SMA. And uh, for the people that have been uh, seeing these patients for many years, again, uh, we're still astonished with the revolution uh, over the last uh, 15, 20 years. Um, as it was discussed before, 128 years of history, but there is this, I feel sometimes that is just the beginning based on everything else that is in front of us to still discover. So the focus of my presentation uh, today will be to talk about the infantile uh, form of SMA. And you will see that with these new interventions, how this classification has been changing over the time. These are my disclosures, and some of those are going to be, um, you know, uh, things that we're going to be discussing during this presentation today in terms of treatments. The learning objectives of this uh, talk is just uh, to try to do it uh, as much interactive as we can. So I really, really would like you to ask as many questions as you can towards the end. Um, but then basically go over a review of what you have heard already this morning in terms of the clinical basis for the disease and describe a little bit uh, in more detail the clinical features and the diagnostic evaluation of a patient that presents with a suspicion of SMA. Then uh, we are going to touch a little bit again on the natural history of the condition and going through different studies have been done over the years in order to assess what is the decline of the patient, does the decline happen uh, equally in all the, the populations, and what to expect. Uh, we are in the era that we are coming with interventions, and we know that, uh, as you probably um, you know, are well aware at this point after the first talks on the day, this is a progressive disease. It doesn't matter whether you are type 0, 1, 2, C, terminal, on seated ambulant, this is a progressive disease. So many times uh, people are looking into improvement. We are all that. But sometimes even a stabilization for us is a success. Um, and then be familiar uh, with the treatment options indicated for this particular age group, as we will have other speakers today going over different ages of presentation. So you are also familiar with this graphic. Um, and, and the, the re revolution with uh, uh, the approval of these uh, new therapies, both in 2016 and, and last uh, this year, in May uh, for Perry's birthday, uh, for the Sol Gensma. Um, and, and then, as, as, as excited as we are, the, the point that I wanted to take on this slide, and, and you know, recognizing the effort of many investigators over the time, um, is, is the fact that now we are facing new problems. And one of the questions that they have for this audience early uh, with the last presentations, what do we tell the patients when they tell, what do I choose? What do I need to be treated with? And this is something that we might not have the perfect answers because as you know, and we will describe a little bit here and Perry did that as well, we don't have many years of follow-up in these patients that are treated. So we don't know, we know what we will expect in the first five years of treatment, but we don't know what will happen later on. So there are many questions that are up, still up in the air, um, not only in terms of the clinical presentation, but also the response of, to all these treatments. So going uh, to the classification um, or the description of this disease, uh, the spinal muscular atrophy corresponds to the progressive muscle disease uh, that have weakness that results from the de degeneration and loss of the anterior horn cells in the spinal cord in the brain and the stem uh, nuclei. But as we heard before, uh, this, uh, there is a component also that doesn't affect only the motor neurons, but also a differentiation from the sensory system as well. Uh, it's secondary to a single gene recessive disease uh, that uh, results in loss of function mutation in the survival motor neuron uh, one gene, as you heard early on. The second uh, most common lethal disease after cystic fibrosis. So, you know, with the newborn screening, we are going to expect to see many, many more patients come into our clinics for early intervention. The carry frequency is uh, one in 50, so there are chances that even in this room we have carriers of this disease. And then the incidence, they are like different reports, but it varies between one in 11,000 to 20,000. So uh, I know that at this stage of the game, you are all experts on what uh, this condition uh, does and what are the uh, genetic backgrounds. But as you know, this is one disease with two genes. And that doesn't happen often in the world of neuromuscular diseases. And in, in, in a way, you could think that it's great that we have another paralog gene 
that that's pretty much the same that the one that these patients unfortunately are missing. Um, so I'm not gonna go in detail because you heard about that a lot, but then as just to be clear, when you don't have SMN1 copies, it is fundamental for you to have SMN2, otherwise it's incompatible with life, and then depending on how many copies of SMN2, the different phenotypes that we'll expect. Knowing that in medicine, two plus two is never four, so we cannot make assumptions based on the copy number only, because there are many other gene modifiers, and we are getting to learn more about us in order to predict phenotype in the long term. So this is the clinical spectrum of SMA, and again, I'm kind of repeating uh, what you have learned in the morning, uh, but uh, we are going to focus our uh, talk today mostly in this particular group that we will call infants. Uh, when I was asked to give this talk, um, I said, what are the infants? It's like uh, less than one year of age, it's less than two, apparently there's more consensus that is less than two years of age. So that's why I included, you know, all the classic types as we learned the zero, one, two, and three, because they can all present within that range. And now that we're gonna have, uh, you know, neonatal screening, then most likely all of them are gonna present without that age that I'm gonna talk to you about. But just uh, to emphasize uh, some aspects of, um, of this condition is that, as I was briefly mentioned before, there is a very rare type that is the fetal form, where the symptoms, of course, it starts occurring intrauterus, and then at the time of birth, the baby is already quite symptomatic to the point that these patients get admitted to the uh, NICU and they, they receive an early consult. Many times it's almost look like a fatal echinacea syndrome because they have severe contractures um, and they are very, very affected with the inability to breathe independently and feed as well. So, you know, um, the, the life expectancy is weeks if you don't do any intervention, but again, the incidence of these cases is very low and they usually these patients tend to have only one copy of SMN2. Then we have the, the big group of SMN1 uh, patients that corresponds to an incidence of 60%. So this is most of what we tend to see. And that was reflected in some of the polls that you did early today, where most of the people were uh, familiar with the earlier forms of the disease and maybe not as much with the adult presentations. And then within that category, we have patients that are very severe, present within the first days of life. Uh, and those are categorized as 1A that you might have seen or read. Uh, in different publications, and then the most common ones, the Bs and C, that is what we tend to see more. These patients used to never sit, things are changing now, um, and then they tend to have uh, the majority two copies of SMN2. However, you know, again, as I was saying before, this is quite variable. Um, the, last ex the life expectancy based on natural history studies that were done prior to interventions uh, are of less than two years of age. Then uh, we have the category of the patients with a classic type two uh, that you know that they were able to sit but never to walk. And this patient will present uh, you know, between six and 18 months of age. Um, and then on those, in that category, again, you can see different variation of copy number, but mostly uh, three copies. And then the life expectancy now, it's like extended to between 20 and 40 years of age. Uh, the incidence is less for this uh, category. And then we have the type three, which are, you know, could present between 18 months to 10 years. And then also within that category, there's a subdivision between the ones presenting before the three years of age as three A's and the ones that are older, like a 3B. So these patients walk, but they will show regression that could happen in different times of their lives. These patients can have, you know, most commonly three or four copies of SMN2, and the life expectancy is uh, normal with a, a lower even incidence than the types two. So, um, you have already started to hear that that um, a type one now can walk. A type two probably we will say will start running soon. So then we are starting to notice that these classifications are going to be evolving, and that's the reason why in the last consensus for the standards of care, the concept was uh, for this classification was subdivided using a more functional classification from the original uh, statement documents. And then as such, we are starting to have the tendency, and you will see for the ones seeing our patients, the reports with the classification more into non-seaters, seaters, uh, considering that, that the type three patients who lost ambulation share many aspects with the type two patients. Uh, so the two groups, again, are, are collectively uh, called seaters, and then they walk that include type three patients who are still ambulant and the type four patients, or you know those type one and two that are now walking. 
So here are a few examples uh, of uh, you know common findings or one we need to raise con uh, you know consideration of uh, SMA as a potential diagnosis. And so this is a classic presentation in the first video of what we know as a floppy infant, uh, with many of the characteristics very classic of SMA type one, um, and where you see like the global hypotonia uh, with and if you check the reflexes after the hyperreflexia that we might miss, and I agree on that point. Um, um, then you will see global reflexia, muscle weakness, usually more infected more in the legs than in the arms, um, and then the frog leg position. Uh, they have poor uh, head control, and as you were seeing in the first uh, video, this paradoxical breathing with a bell-shaped chest deformity. And then these patients do have valvular weakness, um, and with that is manifested by a weak cry, difficulty swallowing, and certainly increased risk of aspiration. Uh, when the patients are present, as I was saying very early on, you can also find early contractures at the level of the elbows if you look carefully. And um, and this is something that may be very very subtle, but can point out to the point uh, to to the fact that this has been there for a long time. What we are seeing in this uh, video on the top is like um, I don't know if because of the light you can see, but this are the classic fasciculations. And then usually this is a, a place where we will look at uh, particularly to identify where they are present or not. The lack of these uh, findings with the fasciculation, uh, it doesn't necessarily um, uh, de uh, deny the, the, the possibility of this diagnosis. And again, I will say that the presence of sometimes very uh, low reflexes, uh, you have to carefully continue to monitor these patients. It's not uncommon in the era that I was trained in pediatrics that when you will have, you know, a kid that is not achieving the, the regular milestones, they show up to a pediatrician between three or six months of age, they say, well, they, let's give them a little time. And the pediatrician might not check the reflexes, and, and that was the concept many years back. We, uh, I, I want to emphasize the importance of when you see a patient with global weakness that seems to be progressive per parents report, even if the reflex is, you can get some, or even if you don't see the, uh, the tongue fasciculations, go ahead and follow these patients or actually go ahead and, and order the test. Fortunately, we are gonna have neonatal screening soon, so that will not be a problem that we'll be facing, but a problem might still be for other parts of the world, and I know that we have representation of uh, members um, of different parts uh, in the globe. The SMA type two, um, they have an onset, uh, it's later, and, and then, um, but they might present, you know, before the, uh, the two years of age. They usually learn how to sit, but they don't walk, uh, and they have um, a very fine tremor. So what we're seeing here in the video is uh, one of my patients. He's a little bit older, although he started to receive tre treatment early on. And then you see something that we call polyminimyoclonus, which is a characteristic tremor that these patients have. And it's, it's more noticeable in patients with a type two and the type three. And now that we are treating the type ones and they are getting stronger, I'm also starting to see that in the type ones as well. They do present with uh, progressive weakness. And of course, they end up having breathing and swallowing problems that is kind of an spectrum uh, with patients that are more severe, but where you will have to do the same interventions. But this leads to poor weight gain as in the type ones and the uh, many difficulties sometimes with very early joint uh, jaw contraction that contributes to the malnutrition and this is something that you have to be aware of the parents more, might not bring this up and then again they develop with the time secondary to the muscle atrophy the presence of joint contractions and scoliosis so uh, when, you know, in this spectrum of years that I show you, uh, they were starting to uh, identify the causing uh, gene for this uh, condition and the development of animal models, it became quite clear, uh, particularly with the recognition of this SMN2 as a potential target for treatment, that we needed to come up with better ways of monitoring these patients in the long term in order to identify what will be the outcome measures that we will use in order to decide whether treatments were efficacious or not. So there were uh, many uh, natural history studies but uh, done previously to the ones that I'm going to show to you right now, but unfortunately, uh, many of those studies, the problem was they were not 
homogeneous in the sense that either there were some patients that were suspected to have the disease, but that disease was not genetically confirmed. Um, and the supportive care, which is a main element in the, the, in the, the course of the disease and how the patients will do regardless of if they have type 1, 2, and 3, was not uh, homogeneous neither. So I, I pick up two of the, the most important studies that uh, were uh, taken uh, in order to uh, find out what were like the parameters that we will look when designing the clinical trials. So one is a study done by Dr. Finkel that we have the pleasure of having him here today uh, through the PNCR uh, co uh, collaboration. Uh, this was a total of 34 patients, 50% uh, completed the 12 months follow-up. And then the other one is a study done at the Neuronext group um, and presenting data was in 2017, but that was also a study that was a study early on um, in 2012 and 2013, trying to identify biomarkers of the disease. And one of the conclusions used on one of the motor, they did several um, scales for, for follow-up of the patients in the long term, is that with the motor function that you're going to learn more about this type of um, the test tomorrow, uh, there was a... It, it, decline. There was no question. Everyone knew, but they were able to quantify this decline. And there are differences between the two tests. Uh, they have different num number of patients um, and the characteristics genetically, but yet, based on the Neuronex, there was a decrease of 10.7 point, uh, points, like a mean rate of decline, and then for the other study, a decrease of 1.27 points. And that was something that was quite helpful in order to determine what we are going to consider success of treatment. And the other important point, as we mentioned before, is the pulmonary function. So in many of these tests also, it was uh, you know, uh, quite able to quantify that uh, more than 90% of the patients with SMA1 will not survive or will need any way of permanent ventilation by age two. So these were two good parameters, as I said, in order to take into consideration at the time of designing these clinical trials. Um, however, we have a patient now with established diagnosis, or we suspect the diagnosis, and then what is going to be our workup uh, algorithm? Well, what do we do? So uh, many times uh, for centers, uh, neuromuscular centers, these patients already come with a diagnosis, but I know that there might be some clinicians in the room that do uh, that come from pediatrics or other centers where you're going to be the first uh, people seeing these uh, infants. So again, raising the suspicions based on those uh, clinical findings that I mentioned to you before. But then once um, you have the clinical suspect, then you're going to look for genetic testing. There are like different modalities of genetic testing that are used by different labs. I would say that the very popular is the quite piece, um, quantitative PCR, uh, but there might be still some centers using MLPA and uh, also sequencing. Uh, with that, it is important for you to determine the, the uh, presence uh, of the deletion on SMN1, and if that is uh, confirmed, um, then uh, no, uh, you would like also to identify the copy number of SMN2. So it's not uncommon for us to receive patients with a diagnosis based on SMN1 uh, copies, uh, but then we actually uh, go ahead and these days we are uh, trying to identify the copy number for SMN2 as well. Uh, there are some cases where, you know, you don't identify the mutation by this first round uh, of studies and you have to uh, use ancillary testing to come up uh, with uh, the same conclusion or also a push for other modalities of uh, gene uh, diagnosis in order to find more rare mutations. So as it was uh, mentioned before, 94% uh, of the patients have exon 7 deletion, but there's a still a remaining type of 6% that might have one exon 7 deletion in one allele and a small mutation in the second SMN allele. And in rare occasions, patients could have small mutations without the deletion. That's quite rare. But if you decide uh, that, you know, the results of the genetic testings were uh, not clear, you might uh, go back to ancillary testing that are uh, not done uh, uh, these days in the, in the regular basis, but then you might as, as someone pointed out, sometimes patients with SMI type 3 might look like a Duchenne muscular dystrophy or a Limgordon muscular dystrophy. And, and if you run a CK, it's not uncommon that they have a mildly elevation. Usually the elevations that we see are in the hundreds, not in the thousands as we tend to see with the muscular dystrophies. But yet that might be co uh, confusing. And the, in the air of panels, you might send for a Limgordon panel, it comes back negative, and it didn't identify uh, the presence of SMA if uh, that is not included in that panel. Um, EMG is another modality that you can do, again, these days we are not doing, and the same is for the muscle biopsy. 
with exception of few cases. When you do uh, electrodiagnostic studies, what we will show is the variable characteristics of motor and axon loss compatible with uh, the motor neuron function, uh, with the loss of that motor neuron function. And however, you know, we do, and, and this is in concordance with what we were learning earlier about the differentiation of the motor neurons, that is in sensor involvement as well. And it's usually rare, but in exceptional cases, particularly in those patients with type zero, you can I, identify some sensory component with the sensory neuronopathy or ganglionopathy. What is the importance of the early diagnosis? Uh, this also was something that was emphasized uh, during the first presentations today. We understand that the early the diagnosis, uh, the more um, uh, the, the better will be the outcome of these patients. And if you see at some of the studies that have been done for uh, the age of the diagnosis, it's like uh, missing, you know, a, a lot of months. So for instance, for the type ones and the type twos, you know, the age of the onset of the symptoms is between 2.5 and 8.3 months. Uh, and then the age of the diagnosis is certainly late. Again, we are expecting that with the neonatal screening, this is gonna uh, dramatically change, and then, as it was mentioned uh, by uh, many here today, we are expecting to launch uh, our program here in um, in California in July 2020. But it might be late June. I know that we are sometime around there. Um, and um, this is uh, something that is related to one of the questions that were asked before. Uh, once we have the diagnosis and the SMN2 copies, uh, what are we going to do? So, you know, there has been some consensus between neuromuscular specialists that if you have two copies, uh, you will offer immediate treatment. If you have three copies, you will do the same. The question comes with the four copies, uh, and, and most uh, uh, agree that you will have to do a close clinical um, observation. Because the problem is that, of course, if you treat early enough, um, and, and the patients, uh, not treating early enough, sorry, uh, and the patients uh, develop symptoms, if you might lack that opportunity or that window, you might be late. But on the other end, uh, there's a burden of these treatments, and there's many uh, questions that are still unknown even for those patients treated with gene therapy, for how long the gene therapy will be efficient. We hope that for, for life, but we don't know that. And then the patients cannot be treated again with the same gene vector later on. Um, so we have to think carefully how we are going to do that, particularly for this type of, of patients. One of the comments that I have in this regard also is the need of better biomarkers. So SMN2 copies are helpful but are not enough. And so gene modifiers and different biomarkers like the neurofilaments, we are hopeful um, uh, that that could also help us as clinicians and families to delineate what's going to be our treatment uh, recommendations. SMA management. So this, uh, you will see that uh, pertains to all the type uh, of SMAs that are going to be discussed today. Um, and they are like um, recommendations that are, are published already that you can go to. But as you see, is they are always patient and family center. Um, and then this requires a multidisciplinary approach. It's almost impossible for a neurologist or a pediatrician or a pulmonologist to take this effort alone. You have to work with a group um, of other clinicians and therapists and social workers and generic counselors um, and orthopedic pulmonary um, to, to identify what are the best treatments for these patients and what will allow us to do a better uh, monitoring of the disease progression and do what is most important, the anticipatory care. So there have been like some uh, guidelines that were uh, recently reviewed in 2018 and uh, where, you know, many aspects of the disease uh, were, um, again, study and try to identify better uh, recommendations uh, of care consideration for these patients. And that includes the diagnosis and genetics, the physical therapy and rehabilitation, the orthopedic care with the growth and the bone health now included in these new uh, considerations, nutritional uh, pulmonary care. But then there were some additions to things that were not present on the first statement, such as acute care in the hospital setting um, or other organ system involvement, which, you know, we are starting and uh, to identify that uh, 
that the, the anterior motor uh, neurons are not the only ones uh, affected, and then we have to look into where we're going with future treatments or combination treatments. Uh, we now have medications, and those have been also included in these new standards of care. But then uh, something not to forget the ethics and the palliative care as well that I will briefly mention towards the end of this talk. So with respect to the neuromuscular evaluation, uh, for the ones that are already seeing patients uh, with SMA, when the patients come, we usually tend to see these patients every four, six months in our clinic. So they do, uh, they are seen by a neurologist provider and physical medicine and rehab provider. And that includes uh, performing a physical examination with a focus primarily on the musculoskeletal system and related functional disabilities. Uh, the choice of the evaluations that we will do, and again, there will be a lot of talks tomorrow in this regard, will reflect the aspects that are more relevant for each uh, level of severity and each group, whether they are non-ambulant or sitters or non-sitters. Um, and then we do a comprehensive review of systems as well. So this in some way is different from your general neurology uh, evaluation. I'm, I want to see if my carpal tunnel is better or worse. This is not a 10 minutes visit. This is a very comprehensive, more than one hour, sometimes two, trying to go over all the different systems and making sure that that family and that patient is receiving the care that they, they, um, they deserve. Um, there are many uh, pediatricians in the area that might not be familiar with the disease or might feel uncomfortable, even, you know, people in the uh, pulmonary specialists that they need to reach to our specialists that are pulmonologists that they have a specific qualification for treatment of these diseases because this is a different uh, population and not many are familiar with that. So, um, so Dr. Shai uh, talked to us today about uh, the approved disease modifying therapies, and, and we have two now, uh, norcinersen approved in, uh, in 2016, and the onasemnogen, I also tried to practice, but I think that he did a better job, um, and uh, or that was recently approved this year. So uh, here you have seen already these graphics, so I was gonna, I'm not gonna spend like more time on them, uh, but uh, I would say, um, I would say only that um, the, the, the problem, if you want, it's good to have these problems, um, it's just like families coming to us saying, what do we do? Do we do gene therapy? Do we do nursing nursing at the time of the diagnosis? And, and again, I will agree with Perry here that uh, I, I offer the options. I tell them what we know. Um, there's certainly more data with nursing nursing because we have been using these uh, for longer. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that one is better than the other one. And the same is for the combination therapies. Uh, however, you know, for many families, it's no brainer that, you know, one treatment only uh, for those infants, uh, because again, like the gene therapy has been approved for only less than two years of age, will be the way to go initially. Uh, but the question remains of whether the effect will wear off at some point and then they will require the, the other combination treatments, whether it's oral or intrathecal infusion and, you know, at the time that the oral is approved, what the oral will be enough at the dose that it is, so we will still need a combination with something else that works intrathecally along with systemic. So again, I have more questions than answers for this part, but it's, it's, it's with great satisfaction that I see that we have something else that is more than supportive care. In terms of the rehabilitation for the non-seaters, again, this is kind of a um, showing more of the things that you're gonna learn with our uh, rehab specialists uh, during uh, further sessions during uh, this course. Uh, but the idea uh, behind this is the optimization of the function, the minimization of the impairment, and optimization of the tolerance to these uh, various positions. And then we have uh, occupational therapy, physical therapies, uh, and speech pathologies that are uh, focusing on different aspects of the rehabilitation. Uh, this is what it has been recommended for sitters, and again, you are, don't worry about like, writing everything, uh, but because you're going to have dedicated sessions for this. So this is what I was meaning about, you know, in the era of new treatments, not longer fit in the category of a non-ambulant. This is a patient type 2 that has uh, received um, a few, uh, nine doses already uh, of nursing and has, you can see his Hammerschmidt score, how he changed, and now he's walking. Uh, he's certainly, you know, with difficulties and then with support. And uh, these videos were taken early on in the year. I can, if you believe me, he's uh, walking much better and with less need of support and independently doing some steps. And uh, with that, it's not only that we are happy to see these changes, but also um, 
there are other problems that come. For instance, um, not necessarily this patient, but someone that is um, acting very similar to him with a, a type 2 is a starting to have severe problems with uh, hip dislocation. It's, uh, it's not painful yet, but this is something that back on the day in SMA2, our colleagues in orthopedics would not even bother. They will not do anything. And at that time, at this time, this patient have scoliosis and now the hip. So uh, some, they go and try to get like um, second opinions what we do. There's some orthopedics that say we need to operate right away. Some others say no why don't we watch since these, change, these things don't change that much. But I want this patient to be standing and I want this patient to continue to walk. So are we going to also change the recommendations in terms of the orthopedic care? And these are going to be things that you're going to see changing along the time as these patients are changing or we're getting to these new phenotypes, phenotype type 5 or 6 or whatnot, as was mentioned before. And these are the re uh, recommendations for the walkers. Uh, more into the orthopedic management, uh, the spine deformity, the hip instability, the contractures, and the management of fractures. Those are all points that are taken into consideration in these new standards of care. And then from the GI standpoint, the nutrition and the swallowing. And, and again, this varies between like the severity of the disease. Um, but uh, these are the common uh, findings and things that we try to ask when the patients are coming to the clinic. The soloing function, this is something that we also share with our colleagues in pulmonary, given the risk of aspiration. Uh, the constipation, the delayed gastric emptying, uh, the bone health. Uh, we usually do recommend uh, the vitamin D, and I know that in many centers we're starting to look at the bone density as well as parameters for follow-up in these patients. Um, and then at the growth charts, uh, we will need um, to be adjusting to uh, the expected growth. This is also another field that is changing. And then for acute illness, particularly in those patients that have very low muscle mass, and I will include like the type 0, primarily, and the type 1s, uh, they can easily go into hypoglycemia due to the uh, lack of muscle mass to do gluconeogenesis. So these is our all things that we need to take in consideration when these patients are sick and the families are uh, seeking for advice of what to do. Pulmonary management, uh, just a slide because you're going to get also a talk about like the care for these patients in different stages of their disease. Uh, but it's very important that you introduce uh, pulmonary care very on, early on in the diagnosis, no matter what type of um, SMA you are talking about. Um, with respect to the assessment and the management in the acute illness, as I was saying, like the importance of uh, the vital signs uh, and how these families or the nurses that are taking care of these patients are aware or, or specific things that will ring a bell and they will be uh, precautions in order to contact their either primary physician or us. Um, the, what are the parameters uh, with these vital signs that are going to prompt, uh, you know, escalation of care, and specific recommendations that these are usually well done by our colleagues in pulmonary, and for those sick days, what is your plan? And all the families should have these plans, um, uh, not only for when to go to the emergency room or also what to do in those sick days, because it's certainly different than any other regular pediatric patient. This is more into how this patient should be transferred to a medical facility and emergency department evaluation. Uh, we, we had uh, a couple of weeks ago or a month ago um, a, a call from one of our dear pulmonologists, Dr. Wu, that will be also uh, giving talks uh, in the rest of the day, that uh, they were, we have a patient that was admitted to another center, and the center was saying that they were feeling very comfortable treating the patients. But uh, this was an SMA type 1 patient that was not even a BiPAP. The BiPAP was not... Uh, um, it was not functional at home, and, and the patient was only provided with uh, oxygen supplementation. And we knew that that was not enough. So this creates also some ethical considerations, how we are going to approach other physicians in the area that are not as familiar with these conditions and try to you know, convince them that the best thing for that patient is just to be transferred to a center uh, of, uh, of uh, more sophisticated care. Um, other medications, supplements, and immunizations, annual influenza and pneumococcal are strongly recommended. Um, antibiotics or medication supplements for um, uh, bone health, uh, such as vitamin D and calcium. Um, we don't have, or at least me in the pediatric clinic, we don't have the experience with biphosphonate for, or the use for early fractures. I don't know if anyone else in the 
um, in the audience, but um, but it's, we know that there are some centers that might be using this as well. And then uh, back on the day, there were some studies that were negative using uh, medications such as albuterol, uh, and, and you will see that there's some centers that might still use it because there's not you know, major side effects, particularly in those patients that can tell you whether there's a benefit or not. And this is something that was used to improve like the muscle function, yet, you know, it's still very um, unclear what is the effect, but you might see that there is some of the patients that you are following that are still taking uh, these supplements or medications. The albuterol, just to be clear, is not the inhaler albuterol, but it's the oral albuterol. Um, in terms of other organs involvement, um, as, as we said earlier, um, it, we know that uh, the, the more vulnerable cells, uh, at least that we know as of now, are the motor neuron uh, cells uh, and uh, affecting the spinal cord and the brain stem. But we know that the SMN protein is ubiquitously present in, in all cells uh, throughout, and, and then they are uh, very important for this uh, postnatal development. Um, so again, the, the discussion is how much we are going to start seeing as we are modifying these phenotypes, the effect of SMN in the brain and the peripheral nerve, the neuromuscular junctions that we already know that plays an important role in the progression of the disease and the manifestation of this disease, the muscle, the heart, the pancreas, and the rest of the vasculature. Um, um, so these are all questions, and I, I know that our efforts are now in trying to determine, you know, better... Um, uh, identifications on patients with these uh, problems as we are moving on in the treatment area. And this is almost kind of to, to uh, finalize my presentation today. So this is what we use uh, to see in our past uh, patients that you know, have that frog leg position, severe hypotonian weakness, very minimal movements of the upper extremities. And as you can see here in the other videos, this is the same patients, one of our face patients, that, uh, uh, investigated in clinical trials, and um, it's not only about walking, it's about being a kid. It's about being able to use your tricycle, and we got this video this week, actually, uh, so it came like a very, uh, in a good time for this talk. She's swimming, and she's an SMA type one. So who could imagine, and I look at Janice here, who was one of our occupational therapists when she was offering, you know, these adapted systems that I can swim, well, she doesn't, have it there, she's doing quite well, and she's doing that on her own and having a lot of fun. So this is not a cure, these are modifying therapies, but they are certainly changing the quality of life of these kids, and that's why we need to keep uh, looking in better ways of treating them. So with that, I'm gonna thank you all for your attention, and then take questions. Thank you very much for a beautiful presentation. I have kind of two questions, and they all revolve around the number four. <laughs> so the first one is type four. I've always been bothered by that. Uh, I remember years ago I asked Victor Dubowitz, how do you define Becker muscular dystrophy? And he said, An, a patient with muscular dystrophy who's ambulatory at 15 years. And I said, well, how about later? And he said, well, that applies up till the end of their life. So it's a becker if it's ambulatory after 15 and forever thereafter until they die. Then we come to SMA, and we say type 3 is, as you defined it, type 4 is at some age later. But I don't understand why we really make that distinction. Why don't we just call them type 3 later onset as opposed to type 4? It seems to be an artificial distinction under those circumstances. And then the other four is four copies, which I'm even more passionate about. We, we've agreed, uh, number one, that 7 to 10% of all the patients we see now who become symptomatic have four copies of SMA. That's type 1, type 2, type 3, as such. Secondly, I don't think anybody has seen a patient with four copies of uh, SMN2 who have not become symptomatic. Now it may be with newborn screening we will finally find such a patient, but at the moment we haven't. And then thirdly, we all agree that early treatment is better than later treatment. So to wait for a four-copy baby to become symptomatic doesn't seem to make any sense to me at all, because to become symptomatic it means 
you've accumulated a disease burden and perhaps lost up to 50% of your motor neurons. And we know you can't fully rescue this, the symptomatic phenotype with treatment. So chalk me up as a person who wants to treat for copy babies when identified with newborn screening. So I, I'm wow. interested in your comments. Yeah. And if you want to read more about this, there's a nice editorial uh, that uh, Dr. DeVivo and Dr. Darris wrote in Neurology last year. And I think uh, to, to that point, the algorithm that you saw that said all patients uh, identified uh, pre-symptomatically with two and three copies should be treated, but there was mixed opinion on the four copies. Um, that same group uh, who provided that opinion uh, was reviewed again, and the shift has now moved towards uh, four copy patients being treated upon recognition. So there has been a, uh, a letter submitted uh, to the editor to suggest a revision to that algorithm. Yeah, and I, I wanted to uh, put in, uh, you know, in this presentation, you know, the different opinions, uh, but, but again, um, it is true. And, and then again, when we see pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, what we are saying, I cannot agree more with that. In fact, there was a presentation that I think at the World Muscle Society meeting this year in Denmark, where they show these patients type four, and there was a different type of outcome measure where they were able to identify the amount of movements in three-dimensionally, and those patients that were, they were looking perfectly normal and perfectly exitomatic, if you will look at the amount of movements done in this particular software and compare with a baby that was not affected at all, those movements were less. So I agree with you. I just wanted to bring up, you know, what is the discussion that is ongoing and what are the sometimes elements, uh, particularly coming from payers, that might not want to agree to, you know, pay for any of these expensive treatments when the patients are, you know, sometimes predicted not to show symptoms for a long time. So we have to come up with, again, as I said before, with better uh, biomarkers so we can identify and, and put the, or classify this patient, if you wish, uh, better than what we're doing right now. So I'm Mark Nunez Kaiser. Um, so in my prior life, I spent three years as the co-director for a metabolic bone clinic at uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital. So we had a couple of Jerry Mandel's spinal muscular atrophy patients in our clinic that we treated with bisphosphonates and a number of other patients with cerebral palsy and other neuromuscular diagnoses, genetic and non-genetic, who had disuse osteopenia. And that's what the cause of the, you know, the osteopenia in these patients is. It's the disuse similar to the, well, that's why we put astronauts on treadmills in right. space, right? So, so, you know, I think that um, um, this is a great, uh, you know, the patients benefited from bisphosphonate treatment and the orthopedic doctors were really thrilled with better surgical outcomes. They said that there was easier for them to put the screws in. They could tell who'd been treated with bisphosphonates and who hadn't. And so the orthopedic surgeons liked it a lot. But I think that this is, again, a nice problem to have. We have the new phenotype. Um, and so the prediction would be that in patients that are swimming mm -hmm. yeah. and walking, that the disuse osteopenia is going to go away. And I would guess that the patients that get treated with cytokines um, or myostatin inhibitors also are probably going to have a better bone health outcome, and that might be something to track. Um, and then just a little nuance, you're lucky to be in Stanford because the pediatric standards for DEXA were developed here 15 years ago, and, and, uh, but most places don't have, um, cool. you know, DEXA, machi Dex DEXA machines with the Hologic uh, Stanford protocols loaded onto them, and so there's good data for DEXA scans in kids over seven. Um, two to seven is kind of, you know, an emerging area. Kids less than two years of age, there's almost no data at all. So I, although I agree with getting a baseline DEXA scan, I think it's challenging in, in, the, in the younger kids, and many institutions don't have the, the equipment to be able to do it. Right. Thank I you think for your comments. towards that point, though, it's, it's really very important. I think more places now are saying, if, if you have a low DEXA and a fracture history, uh, then you get treated. I think the question remains, when your Z-score is really low, like minus eight, minus 11 for your distal femur. Uh, and these little children are zooming around in their power chairs and they're likely to just bump their knee and, that's, and they can get a crush injury uh, fracture at the distal femur. Uh, do you treat them preemptively? Uh, I don't know that the field has really come to a consensus yet on that, but that, it's moving in that direction. 
we were treating such patients, you know, uh, you know, but we were fairly aggressive in, in Columbus, mm -hmm. you know. But but again, I think we've changed. The, we're changing the phenotype. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we have a, a couple questions that came in. Uh, so let me just see if we have time to address these. Uh, one is, uh, in both uh, Spinraza pre-symptomatic and symptomatic treatments, there seems to be an increase in the high knee scores, which is the motor function scale that we'll learn more about, at about two months post-treatment, uh, perhaps after the loading period. Can you speak to the onset of action of Zolgensma, the gene replacement therapy? Uh, and we'll, we'll, leave, we'll focus on the type 1s here. Right, yeah. Um, I, I would say that um, this is uh, probably more for my, my personal exposure to the patients. And some of these, I will have to say that they, they were already, some of them, they were already receiving spin rasa. But I, 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 I have seen, at least anecdotally, like the patients able to do um, better in terms of fun function in their muscles, particularly in the lower extremities, sooner than these two months. Uh, but again, I would like you to take this with a grain of salt because it's mostly like in the individual cases and sometimes in patients that are uh, treated concomitantly with other uh, treatments. Good. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's time to move on to the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.